Now today's talk, Mathematics Education for the Flat World, What Should We Be Teaching Our Children for Life in the 21st Century? Keith will give a short presentation and then that will be followed by a conversation with Angie interspersed with your questions. And for those of you who don't know who these people, people are, let me just give you short bios. Angie Coiro is an award-winning journalist and interviewer. Her work has aired nationally on Mother Jones Radio, Air America, and on Public Radio. Locally, she's known for her hosting work on Live from the Left Coast, The Angie Coiro Show, KQED's Friday Forum, and KGO Radio. Dr. Keith Devlin is co-founder and executive director of Stanford University's H-Star Institute and a World Economic Forum Fellow and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. His current research is focused on the use of different media to teach and communicate mathematics to diverse audiences. He has written 31 books and has published over 80 research articles. Among the awards he has received are the Pythagoras Prize, the Pino Prize, and the Carl Sagan Award. And he's also the math guy on National Public Radio. Please welcome Dr. Keith Devlin. Thank you, Leslie, and uh, welcome, everyone. And if someone will switch me on, uh, we'll get some visuals, and I'll give a short talk uh, to sort of throw some ideas out, uh, some somewhat provocative ideas, deliberately provocative, and then Angie will come back and we'll, we'll talk at some length. Um, we are recording this for the, for the Commonwealth Club for later broadcast on NPR, and so I will say things that you could actually read. There's not a lot of text, um, but I'm not assuming you're unable to read. I'm just doing it the way they do on the news hour, making sure that the audio track has enough information that they can pick up on. Okay, so The Flat World. There are two books, I think, are very there are many books that are pertinent to anyone who's in the education business, but there are two that are particularly relevant now that wouldn't have been suggested some time ago. And we have lost the connection from this thing. Let me hold it up and see what happens. Okay, I'm going to have to keep holding my hand up. Yeah. There's probably a very tall person sitting between me and the thing at the back. Okay, but feel free to stay there, please. Uh, one is the, the book by Thomas Friedman, a little bit long in the tooth now. It was a bestseller when it came out, called The World is Flat. And then slightly more, somewhat more recent, is Timothy Ferris's book, The Four-Hour Workweek. And both of those describe how globalization is affecting the way we work, how outsourcing is affecting the way we work. Timothy Ferris has this particularly provocative challenge that says, if you're smart, you could actually make a good living just working four hours a week and just be an orchestrator of things that happen all around the world uh, with ideas and information at almost the speed of light, uh, traveling along ethernet cables and so forth. So, both of these talk about the, the world that we've created for ourselves, the world of outsourcing and the, the global world that we live in. Uh, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing is sort of irrelevant now because it's what is and we have to deal with it. And in particular, the kids that come out, that come out of our schools and colleges have to deal with that too. Okay. And it's a salutary thought for someone like myself who studied hard and got a couple of degrees and wrote books and things to realize that most of what I studied hard to learn, which for many decades was a very marketable skill. I led a pretty good life. I traveled around the world. I did consulting. I did lecturing, professor at various places. I had a set of marketable skills, uh, advanced mathematical skills, and they were very definitely marketable. I chose to stay mostly in universities with some consulting, but I also could have gone and worked in industry and actually made a lot more money, but uh, the universities were fun. Those days, to some, I mean, in terms of what I learned, those days are clearly gone. Everything, that I speci everything specific that I learned at college and at university, right through graduate school, can now be outsourced very quickly and easily. In fact, you know, we think of outsourcing as things like uh, customer support, airline reservations, you know, the person that is unable to fix your problem with AT&T and that kind of thing. That's what we think about in terms of outsourcing. Or maybe we think in terms of Apple manufacturing the iPad in China and so forth. We have these visions of 
large hangar buildings full of people either assembling things or manning banks of telephones or sitting at computer screens um, in, in either India or China or parts of the former Soviet Union and so forth. <clears throat> Those are the images we have. But if you think about it, mathematics is one of the easiest things of all to outsource. If you're a company in the United States, you probably don't need to employ a full-time mathematician anyway, but every now and then you might need a mathematician to do some optimization work or to solve some problem. Instead of hiring somebody in, you could just sit at your desk, send an email message to an outsourcing company in India at five o'clock in the evening, during the night while you sleep, maybe 20 or 30, 30 people in Bangalore or somewhere will work on this, very well-trained mathematicians, and by the time you're at your desk at 9 o'clock the next morning, the answer is there. In duplicate, tested for accuracy because it's been done by several people. And that can be done very instantly. There's, there's, there's no physical things need to be transported. It's just a mathematical problem. So mathematics is extremely easy to outsource, and it's quicker than outsourcing coding. Computer code can take days or weeks or months to build. Solving a mathematics problem may take just three or four hours. Instantly outsourceable. So the question is, in a world where everything someone like me studied hard to learn at college and university, where that is no longer a marketable skill in the Western world, and in, in, in the United States and Europe, what are we going to do to help our kids? Um, by the way, I'm going to be focusing a little bit about jobs involving mathematics, but I, as, I, as I go through, I think you'll realize that I'm really talking about preparation for life because the days when those of us in countries like the United States separate work from play, from recreational activities, they're long since gone. We use the same devices in our social life and our business life. The, 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 the gap between, the distinction between work and play and recreation is rapidly disappearing for most of us. So in a world where we can outsource the stuff that we typically teach in schools and universities in mathematics classes, what are we going to be doing? What should we focus on? We, we, we actually we have a freedom to make a choice now, and I think we have a need to make a choice. The United States has sort of backed itself into making a choice, and we've gone for the idea of, of looking at these international rankings like PISA from the OECD, which is kind of unfortunate because we don't do very well at those things. You know, we're at number 31 in math, uh, below almost all of our industrial competitors. Uh, we do slightly better than, than reading. At reading, in fact, in reading we are above the average. The averages are mentioned there, uh, and in science we do pretty poorly as well. Um, one of the countries, by the way, that's at the top in most of the, in all of those three is Finland. Um, my institute at Stanford does a lot of collaboration with Finland and the Finnish education system. And the interesting thing about Finland is they're not interested in these test results. They're actually making a, quite a good living out of them now. But they were surprised when this happened because Finland doesn't focus on international comparison tests. They don't focus on standardized tests at all. They do have some standardized tests, but really what Finland education system is about is educating the whole person for future life in society. And it's not about doing well on tests or getting a good job. It's a different approach to education. And it turns out that if you focus on that, you do end up doing well on the tests. That's what we focus on. As I say, it's unfortunate because we don't do very well in terms of those things, and it's not at all clear we could improve our, our scores at those. We do much better if we think about what happens when people graduate. You know, one of the strange things about the United States is we simultaneously have the worst, one of the worst medical records in the, in the world with infant mortality and so forth, and yet we have the best medical care in the world. In the case of medicine, we, we occupy the two poles, really bad and really good. If we think of education, the same thing happens. We have a lot of problems with, our, with the international comparison tests, with, with what comes out. But if you think about the people that come out that are at the other end of the spectrum, we still lead the world in innovation, new ideas, and so forth. So it's partly a result of wealth. But it's also something to do with the way we educate people. Uh, we do extremely well in innovation. And it's clear to anyone that lives in the United States that our only future in terms of economic competition 
is to steer that apex of the, of the pyramid, the innovation apex. And just to sort of get a sense of that, it's always good to go to the other side and see what things look like from the other side of the fence. And there was a quote came uh, out of Fast Company that caught my attention last September. And this is by the CEO of one of these big Indian outsourcing companies. Uh, he lives in Silicon Valley, by the way. And uh, this is a company with 26,000 highly trained people, scientists and technologists, computer programmers and engineers, sitting in, 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 in large offices over in India that deal with stuff that's been outsourced from the United States and Western Europe. And here's what he says. Okay, so this is the voice of the enemy, the person that's taking all the jobs away from us. Okay, the US education system is much more geared to innovation and practical application. It's really good from high school onward. And here's the kicker. To compete long term, we need more brainstorming, not memorization, more individuality, not standardization. And you've got to ask yourself, if he's right, and he's, he's, been, he's very successful in taking away a lot of work from the United States, but if he's right about what we have that they don't have, and that China doesn't yet have, then standardized tests are not the way to go. This is not about standardization. This is about thinking outside the box. Standardized tests are learning to think inside the box. We've got to ask ourselves whether we want to train a generation of kids who can do what they're told, who can follow instructions and can think inside the box. I made a good career out of being really good at that. But I don't think my kids or anybody else's kids are going to be able to make a good life by being able to think inside the box. We are, whether we wanted to be or not, and I think we did, one of the world leaders in innovation. This part of the world, obviously the case, we're in Silicon Valley. Things happen here all the time. Mathematics is part of what's going on in Silicon Valley. It's an invisible part for the most part. But mathematics has always changed. Mathematics has changed and mathematics education has been changing for millennia. Ever since mathematics began with the invention of numbers around 10,000 years ago, it's been changing, it's been expanding, and the education has changed too. But if you go back through history, you'll find that education has lagged behind the needs of society. Go back to medieval times, the main need that people had was for elementary arithmetic. It was about buying and selling things on a small scale. Individual manufacturers, individual sellers and buyers, um, you needed some elementary arithmetic to get by whatever you were doing. And the education was fairly standard. So go back to medieval times and you get this model of education based on instruction. Someone stands in the front of a class and explains how to do something. There were books produced. The image that you're looking at is an image from a copy, a handwritten copy from the 13th century of the first arithmetic textbook in the Western world. That particular book is in the university, in, is in the public library in Siena. Um, I have actually seen that book and I had that image taken. And having read that book, except for the fact that it's handwritten and in Latin, it looks like a modern arithmetic textbook. It tells you how to do arithmetic using Hindu-Arabic numerals, units, columns, ten columns, and so forth. So mathematics education in the sense of arithmetic has been pretty static since the 13th century. In fact, you can trace it back to a book written in, in Baghdad in the 9th century by Al-Khwarizmi, so it goes back to the 9th century and before. So it hasn't changed a lot, and it doesn't need to, because arithmetic has been stable for, for at least a thousand years now. Let's fast forward from the medieval times to the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution. Work changed, society changed with the Industrial Revolution, but the mathematics that was being used didn't change very much. It was still people sitting and being instructed. It was about learning how to do things, to follow instructions, to be a cog in the wheel. The Industrial Revolution, is, as we look back, it looks kind of scary because everyone was explicitly a cog in the wheel. Okay, I'm not sure that it looks any different in Facebook in terms of what, what's really going on, but it's still you're a cog in the wheel. So the educational didn't really change much from medieval times. Going to the 20th century, things look a little bit different. You have large office buildings, you have large hangar-like rooms 
full of people sitting at desks, either writing or using machinery or so forth. Again, making a living depended upon following instructions. It's been shown how to do something and then doing it repetitively over and over again. And the mathematics didn't change at all. The only thing that happened in the 20th century is people wore different clothing. But it's the same picture, a teacher and a class instruction, a one-way flow, here's how to do it, practice it, and when you're good at it, we'll give you a certification and you can go out and make a living doing it. Now let's go to the late 20th century. You look at a workplace, many of the workplaces in the late 20th century, you see lots of machinery and equipment and not so many people. People began to disappear from the main engines of society, the main workplaces. And those people were doing something else. They were using their minds in a different way and they weren't using their, their bodies quite the same way. The education system didn't change. Although society was changing and changing fast. The education system was still largely the same. It was instruction, one person telling somebody else how to think outside the box. So the question I want to ask is, is the instructional model, it's exactly a question in two parts. How should we be teaching and what should we be teaching? And the first part is, is the instructional model where I, as a teacher, show you how to do something, let you practice, and then check how well you're doing it, is that the appropriate model to use in today's society? Well, let's compare that image of a society, of, of a classroom, with the kind of workplaces that most of us occupy. I suspect that most of you in this room, like me, spend a lot of our, my time not being shown how to do something, not doing repetitive tasks over and over again, but brainstorming, sitting around with a group of people, arguing, talking about ideas, throwing ideas onto a whiteboard. This is what Silicon Valley does. This is what universities do. This is the society we live in. It's all about thinking outside the box and working collaboratively. So is that picture of the classroom appropriate? It certainly doesn't look right. So the meta lesson that you get from school if you're in a traditional classroom that it's all about working on your own, somewhat in competition with everybody else, work quietly, work diligently, don't talk to your neighbour. That's not the way people are going to be working when they leave school. So uh, you know, a school that's still doing that, I think, is ill-serving uh, their kids because that's not the way their kids are going to, be, uh, going to be working. And I think one thing education should do, well, it should do two things, it could prepare people for life, and prepare people for living that life. And that includes uh, working, following a profession, following a career. Okay. Not all schools are like that. Schools have been changing for the last 20, 30 years. They've been adapting. And you can go into many schools now, and you don't see that traditional model. You actually see it a lot in India, incidentally. That they still have a very traditional one. I was also in Australia a couple of years ago. Australia still has a lot of traditional-looking schools with traditional-looking classrooms. But many schools and universities now, people are learning in the way that they would be working when they leave college and university and school. Collaboratively, on teams, uh, project-based learning, doing the kind of thing that people will do in the rest of their life. So there we've got some images of how we should be teaching. I think we need to get away from, and we are getting away from, the idea that it's about instruction. The teacher needs to stop being the sage on the stage and start being the guide on the side, helping the students learn. It's no longer about instruction. You know, that, that was important in the days before there were photocopy machines. I mean, one of the things instructors did was they spread the word. I mean, the only way you could get information was to sit in front of someone who had it and copy it down while they lectured on it. But that really uh, disappeared when we had sort of various kinds of copying devices. And in the days of the internet and YouTube and so forth, clearly that's no longer required the way it was. <coughs> okay, so the question I want to, I want to turn to the second question now, what should we be teaching uh, in that form? So grant me, please, that we will regard the, the, the schools as places where kids learn collaboratively on team-based 
learning, project-based learning, the kind of thing that they are most likely to do when they leave school, and the question is what should they be teaching? Well, let's just see how things have changed throughout history. And I want to talk in terms of what I'm calling the ions of mathematics, I-O-N-S, except I need to pronounce it eons, because there have been a number of important eons in the history of mathematics. In the medieval times, there were four eons, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's what you learnt in medieval times because that was what the mathematics was required in your life and in your work. So the first era, there were four eons. Go right up to the 19th century in the Industrial Revolution, those four eons were still basically all everyone needed. If you could do addition, multiplication, subtraction, division, that was a good skill set for life and work in the 19th century in the Industrial Revolution. Going to the 20th century, the late 20th century, when you've got technology, you need differentiation and integration. You needed calculus. So to do well in a technological company, in a technological world, you needed to have some experience and some knowledge of calculus. So calculus became part of the important skill set. It certainly was when I graduated from university. Go to today's day, today's workplace, and there are two more eons, communication and collaboration. We never used to think of those as part of mathematics education. We should. Those are just as important eons as differentiation and integration and addition, multiplication, subtraction and division. These two eons are part of what it takes to be a mathematician today and to use mathematics today. And in the United States, given what I've said, there's another eon we need to worry about. Innovation. We need to educate kids to be innovative thinkers. They need to be able to look at a new problem and think about it in novel ways. Here's what we want, I would say, in today's world. Innovative mathematical thinkers. I'm, I'm no longer calling this doing mathematics because doing mathematics carries with it some baggage. We have an image of someone doing mathematics. What we should be thinking of is what I'll call innovative mathematical thinking. Because this, I think, is what we should be focusing on in the United States, particularly in California on the West Coast. And this is what we should be focusing on, producing, <coughs> excuse me, producing innovative mathematical thinkers. And I'm distinguishing mathematical thinking from mathematics, because mathematics is, is associated in our minds by default as following procedures. The kids we graduate from our schools and universities today, we don't want them to think inside the box. Teaching them by following instructions is the last thing we should be doing. We need to teach them how to think outside the box. We need to help them to learn to think outside the box. Instructions are part of that, but it's a part of it. It's not the whole product. One of the things we want them to be able to do is find, adapt existing methods and techniques for novel situations. People become important and, 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 and and a brain that cannot be outsourced becomes important when it's capable of thinking about something new. A mathematical problem that's been specified and can be solved by an existing technique can be outsourced and done much more cheaply than anyone in this country. So that's not a valuable skill. Thinking innovatively, finding a new use for mathematics, that's powerful. You know? Let's not forget those two graduate students at Stanford who back in the 90s thought of a novel way of using mathematics to search for information on the World Wide Web. That's thinking outside the box. Think about how you can find information. We've got Google as a result of that. Now that's a special case, it was a spectacular case, but we need lots of cases like that. Finding new approaches, methods and techniques for new problems. So adapting old techniques. That was really what the Google, actually the Google thing was a little bit of both. There was, there was, mostly there were old mathematical techniques, but there was some novel thinking going in as well. So thinking, adapting old techniques, finding new approaches and methods, that cannot be outsourced easily. Collaboration with others, absolutely critical today. Most of the problems we face are interdisciplinary, very complex. You're not going to solve them on your own in a room the way I was taught to, to do mathematics. Uh, several decades ago. Multidisciplinary teams, collaborative work. 
That involves communication. Good communication skills are absolutely critical. You know, the day when a student in the math class could complain because they've been docked marks for not communicating well should be gone. Because if you can't communicate well, you don't deserve a first class degree in mathematics unless it's a really good first class degree. I'm not going to throw away the jewels. We have some jewels. So that's what people, I think, need to be able to do when they graduate from school on university. What have they got to have? In terms of mathematics, they certainly need a broad sense of the scope, power, and limitations of the subject. And it has limitations. They need good, but not necessarily stellar, mathematical ability. I'm talking about most people. So most people need this to be able to make choices about how they live their lives. They need the ability to quickly master new mathematical techniques. Acknowledging the fact that almost certainly anything they learn at university is likely to be obsolete within two years of graduation because things have moved and changed. And let me stress that phrase, not necessarily stellar. For most people, it never was important to be extremely good at mathematics. So a system that sort of is geared towards producing the stellar mathematicians never did serve the, the majority well anyway and was kind of misguided because the stellar mathematicians will get there anyway. For sure, we need, we need people like this. We need people who can do original mathematics. And we produce them. They produce themselves. You know, Stanford is full of them, Harvard is full of them, and those of us that teach at those institutions, we might as well not turn up actually, because they're going just, they'll do just fine if we don't turn up. Um, they're really smart people, they teach themselves, they get a little bit of help. And we produce more of these people than we can possibly employ. You know, the, the biggest problem you have at a university like Stanford is graduate students, people that graduate with good mathematics qualifications have trouble finding jobs that they want to do, that, that, that use their skills. So there's no shortage of people at the top end. We need people that can do this other stuff, the interdisciplinary work that involves bits of mathematics, bits of graphs, bits of computer coding, um, some talking with various other people from different disciplines, this milieu of, of interdisciplinary thinking. Uh, that's what we need lots of. And if you talk to any of the main employers in the valley, this is what they have trouble finding. This is why they comb the world for these kind of people. It's very hard to find people with that kind of innovative thinking skills. So I'm going to leave you with, I think, the big picture, and then Angie will come up and, and, and cross-examine me on what I've been saying. We have a choice. Should the primary goal of education today, focusing mainly on mathematics education, should it be teaching mathematics, as that's commonly understood? And that's usually understood in terms of instructional models. Show people to how to solve certain kinds of problems. In other words, mathematics is presented as a collection of definitions, facts, rules, representations, methods, algorithms, formulas. Learn how to recognize a problem, we tell the students, and then apply the appropriate technique. Exactly the kind of stuff that can be outsourced. That's, that's, that's what we're doing most of the time. What we should be doing, I think, and that's the alternative, is focusing on developing this thing I'm calling mathematical thinking. What's that? It's a habit of mind. It's a way of thinking about problems in a certain kind of way. We spent thousands of years as society developing this way of thinking about the world, this mathematical way of thinking, an innovative way of thinking, of analyzing, pulling things apart, putting them together. It's not rule-based. It uses rules. It needs the rules. You can't do it well unless you have a bank of rules underneath you. So I'm not saying we throw away all sorts of rule-based learning and just think freely. That's not going to work. That sounds like 1960s in San Francisco, right? No. There's a lot of techniques need to be known and, and, and learned. But the point is, learning those techniques by the instructional model isn't the way to go because that's not how they're going to be used. Those techniques that we spend hundreds of years developing should be tools that can be used in thinking about the world in a certain kind of way. And the reality is, and Finland stumbled across this, by accident actually, if you develop mathematical thinking skills, 
Once people have acquired them, they can acquire any number of techniques very easily and they're then well placed for life and careers in the flat world. And now we'll bring Angie up and she'll uh, start firing the questions away. And there's a book, I published a book a year ago um, which talks about this approach to education. Um, you'll notice in the subtitle of the book, it's Mathematics Education for a New Era. That's what I've been talking about. The subtitle is Video Games as a Medium for Learning because it turns out that one of the best ways to learn that kind of thinking is by playing well-designed video games. And we can get into that later as well if you want. You've brought me to tears. <laughs> <laughs> Allergies. That, that's that's, that's, a, that's a, an occupational hazard if you're a mathematics professor. <laughs> People cry. I mean, what can you do about it? You know? I want to start by looking at some of the terms you were using. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of you were here the first time that we were fortunate enough to have Keith here. And you made a distinction that I think we should make again, which is the difference between arithmetic and math. Yeah. So what just, tell me how that distinction applies to what you just gave us. Yeah, so um, for many hundreds of years, the most important skill that people had for living and, uh, and, and for careers was, was basic arithmetic. It was the beginnings of mathematics. It goes back 10,000 years. Numbers were actually invented to give us money. The first application of, of, of numbers was money. In fact, the first numbers were money. Um, it, everything goes back to money. You know, nothing's new in the world. So uh, numbers came along and arithmetic came along so that people could do transactions in a more effective way, keep track of things. And for many, many hundreds of years, that was still a, a, a key skill, um, both for society, for buying, selling, for, for following careers. Um, and it's still a very important thing to have at the back of your mind in a sense. But as time went by, that was expanded to include things like geometry and trigonometry and probability theory and then calculus and then more modern mathematical disciplines. Uh, you know, th there's probably 70 or 80 different branches of mathematics today. Uh, so it's a huge number. Go back to the 16th to 17th century, there were probably 10 or a dozen branches of mathematics. So mathematics has been blossoming. Uh, there's almost a hockey stick growth in mathematics. And arithmetic has just been sitting there unchanging. You know, you can, as I say, the, the, an arithmetic textbook today looks very much like one that was written in the ninth century. That, that, that stabilized very early. The rest of mathematics grew and having, I mean, once we invented pocket calculators, apps that do our arithmetic for us, the days when we needed to have really good arithmetical skills were gone. Um, I, I have to admit, I now have almost lost all my ability at doing arithmetic because I don't practice it. You know, I'm, if, I, if I have to add together more than five or six figures in a column, I now use a calculator, even if they're simple ones. Ten years ago, I think I, could have, I would have made the distinction at about 20. Now, you know, I, I, adding, a, adding the scores of a class, for example, to do an average, I used to just do it in my head because it was quicker to do it in my head than to get a calculator out. I've lost that ability. I can't plough a field anymore either. <laughs> I never could plough a field, but my grandfather probably could. It's, it's gone. But does it matter in terms of your larger education that your brain doesn't have that elasticity? I mean, doesn't that feed into innovation and all the other work we're talking about? The elasticity is very important. Um, the, uh, in fact, the elasticity is more important now than it ever was because things change so, so rapidly. You know, as, in the days even when I was graduating, if you were good at arithmetic, there were many stable careers that you could follow for your entire life. Uh, you know, the, the images of mathematicians is very often someone who's doing arithmetic. Um, the reality is someone who calls himself a mathematician almost never deals with arithmetic at all. Uh, and when they deal with numbers, they're not specific numbers, they're general numbers. Uh, so we can talk about uh, the teaching of mathematics as something separate where rote memorization and learning how the figure still matters. And when you talk mm -hmm. about kids learning mathematics, now you're talking about upper grades and into college mm -hmm. learning how to do the larger scope. Just wanted to define that. So we don't think that we're sitting second graders down and saying, innovate. <laughs> no, no, no. Innovate it's... your way around this division problem. There's an issue of form in the basis, but the... There's a distinction now. When, when you and I learned arithmetic, it actually was important to us to be able to do arithmetic and get the right answer, even with complicated numbers. 
because the only way to ever do it was to do that, either in your head or with a paper and pencil. But now everybody is going to use a machine to do arithmetic when it gets to a certain, you know, if there's more than two or three digits involved. That means we need a different skill. I, you know, it, parents with kids in schools these days have a lot of trouble because their kids come home from school with their arithmetic homework and the teachers have taught them different methods. They don't use the same algorithms that we used in the medieval times, the ones that you and I learned, the, 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 the sort of so-called classical algorithm. They use different algorithms. There's a good reason why teachers started using different methods in the schools, because it was no longer important to be able to get the right answer quickly with a long list of numbers to add together. But if you're using machinery, you need a higher level ability with numbers. The way kids are taught arithmetic now is aimed to optimise understanding of numbers not optimising procedures using procedures. The classical algorithms optimised getting the answer accurately and quickly. Machines do that part. The new algorithms we teach in schools are optimised to understand numbers in a deep way that allows us to use them in novel ways. You talked early on, in fact it was your second, or I think it was your second slide, you talked about how well Finland is achieving and what mm -hmm. I found intriguing about that was you said they're not focused on winning tests or watching what's happening internationally. Are they focused on what you went on to suggest, thinking outside the box? What's their way of getting at the top of that list? Yeah, yeah, I mean Finland is you know, it's a small country of four and a half million people, it's a world player. I mean how many people were surprised when they learned that Nokia was not a Japanese company? I was! I thought, you know, <laughs> Nokia, it's a Japanese company. Um, no, Nokia was a Finnish company. It used to make rubber boots in this little village outside of Helsinki called Nokia. I actually, the, I, I remember the first time I went to this place called Nokia. I was on a train from, I think, Helsinki to Tampere, and it stops at this little whistle stop station, and it said on it, Nokia. I thought, well, it was. The, <laughs> how does a small country like Finland get to be a global player? They lead the innovation game. They are heavy into innovation. And, uh, you know, it's not just Nokia, that's where Angry Birds comes from. They have some of the most innovative video game developers there as well. Finland got where it is and is going to have to stay there to survive by being innovative and by producing people who are really good original thinkers. And by golly, they've done it. I have to commend this audience. You've already given me so many questions that I, I'm throwing my notes out and going right to this. is actually very good. I do want to remind you, though, if you do have questions related to the lecture to what we're talking about now, the cards are on your chairs. Just go ahead and, and give them to Leslie and she'll bring them up. Great deal of them here. Uh, actually, someone was following the same thread you and I were just talking about. Can you define collaboration and what that would look like, for example, in a middle school? You're past the arithmetic. You're past the basic procedures. What does early collaboration look like? You get people in small groups and you give them interesting projects that mean something for them. But for instance, pick a project. What would a project look like? You might want to ask yourself, which is the best deal if you're buying an iPad? What's the, you, know, you, the, you get different prices for the different iPads and they have different capabilities. So class project. What's the best deal at different price ranges if you want to buy an iPad and you want to maximise the utility and you want to keep the cost within your level? And there's a lot of parameters there. You can, the amount of mathematics that can bring in is, is endless. You can see, you certainly find yourself drawing graphs, looking at slopes of graphs, seeing whether things are steeply, you know, is, the, is, is there a break point when you go for a, beyond a certain level of, of memory? Everyone's interested in it, grabs their attention, and it involves a ton of mathematics. If you approach teaching, thinking of the curriculum as a list that you have to tick off one after the other, then it's going to become very dull. The way we should be using a curriculum is you have this list of topics that you want them to have mastered by the end of the year. And you have a project and they start working on projects and as they work on the projects and they need more techniques, you start ticking off in whatever order they come up the topics on the curriculum. And if halfway through the, the semester you find that there's a whole area of the curriculum that hasn't been covered, you give them another project that's likely to bring those things into it. So, don't expect the kids to want to learn the mathematics for its own sake, but mathematics is about thinking in the world and doing things in the world. And the interesting problems in mathematics are the ones that arise in the world. There was an interesting, and I follow all sorts of blogs out there, there was an incredible one that came out this, this last week. Someone had looked at the various blaster devices in Star Wars 
and said, let's figure out how fast the beam went when they were fighting these things. They weren't lasers because they, you saw them cross the screen and you saw them cross the, the, the empty sky. And someone looked at the movie Star Wars, timed these things and said, this, this was a great physics teacher, and said, how fast were those weapons that were being used in Star Wars? And how effective might they be? What a great project. It excited me, for sure. It's going to excite a kid. I'm, not, I'm really just another kid. So, yeah, that would have excited. There's, there's no shortage of exciting things to do that will involve whatever mathematics you want to, you want to bring into it. Well, one of the strengths a really good teacher has is understanding that all kids learn a different way. Does that yep. change substantively when you're talking about moving from the sage on the stage to getting to the side and, and urging them on? Does that change how a teacher would evaluate how a student Teaching is doing it? Teaching gets harder and it gets more expensive and we better be prepared to pay people more. One of the things Finland did was the, the hardest profession to get into in Finland is become a teacher. Only the top 10% of people in the educational system get into education school. It's a very selective career and it's highly revered. They did, basically what Finland did, when they, this was like 30, 40 years ago, they deliberately said, we will simply make teaching the, most, the best profession. Not the best paid, it's still not the best paid profession, but they decided to make it the most revered profession so that people would want to become a teacher. That was all it took. I mean, I say all it took, it's even took them several decades. But the point is, the kind of teaching I'm talking about it's hard work and it involves a lot of education, a lot of background. Uh, you know, we, we're not fair to our teachers in this country. We ill prepare them, we don't treat them very well, we don't pay them very well, and then we say, you're not getting good results. Well, give me a break. If I was, teaching, if, if I was treated like a high school teacher, I'd walk out. I read what people say about them, I read the, the, the working conditions, I wouldn't put up with it. How does it become more expensive to teach that way? You pay them better? You have to pay them better. You have to pay them better. And, and, and make them more, it's a more selective thing. In other words, someone today, in, in mathematics, if you're a good mathematician and you're teaching and, and, and life gets bad and you've got a friend who works at Facebook who says, we need some more mathematicians to work on this project and you'll get paid three times as much and life will be a lot better, the you're choice? going to walk away and do it. <laughs> You need to make it go the other way. I mean, one of the things that happens in Finland is people from Nokia think, I want to go and become a teacher. And they go in the other direction. One of our audience members wants to, you to go into your idea of video games helping to learn creative ways. Can you expound on that a bit? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, well, there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of features. That, the reason I wrote a book is that there's a whole bunch of features that go into this. But one of the things we do know is that if you're learning something to do, the best way to learn how to do something is to do it. If you want to learn how to ride a bike, you don't read a book, you buy a bike and you practice. If you want to learn how to play tennis, you don't read a book, you don't sit in a classroom, you start to play tennis and you get someone to help you learn. Well, mathematics is actually something you do. Now, it's not something you do physically, it's something you do in your mind, but it's an action. It takes time, it needs effort, and you're tired. That suggests that it's something you do, not something that you know. So mathematics is something that you do. You've got an organ that does it, it's the brain. You're using that brain. There's, no, there's very little physical activity, but you're using a brain. And the best way to learn how to do something is experientially, because the human being, Homo sapiens' main survival trick, is learning from experience. Any of our life's experiences, we cannot help but learn something. So if you're doing something that involves mathematical thinking, you're gonna learn mathematics. Carpenters who fail at their math classes in school, once they become a carpenter, get pretty damn good at doing trigonometry. In fact, if you get builders in to do alterations at your house, be prepared to repaint the walls, because all over the walls will be right angle triangles and numbers and figures and things. They've been doing arithmetic and trigonometry on the walls of your house while they do the work. They learn it by, by experience. There have been many studies carried out um, around the world where social scientists have followed people around in their jobs and in, and in their shopping and in their daily activities and watched how they use mathematics in the real world and there's an interesting statistic when people regularly use mathematical thinking in a real world context they quickly get to the point of being able to do it efficiently with 98 percent accuracy if you take those people and you give them a written math test 
with the same mathematical problems that they've solved in the real world with 98% accuracy, but in, in, in paper and pencil form, they don't score at 98%, they go up down to about 37%. Mathematics in a real world context is learned, and it's learned well. In a decontextualized classroom setting, it's learned poorly and done poorly. Video games are simulators of real world activities. You play a video game, you interact with it. It's that interaction that forms the learning. All you need to do is put the mathematics into a video game setting as a simulator. And it changes the goal as well. Changes the goal. You're learning by doing. You're, you're, you're probably solving all kinds of equations, you're probably doing all kinds of things, but it doesn't seem that way. You're actually solving a real life, you know, you're probably killing a monster or escaping from somewhere or building something, but that's different. That's, a, that's an activity. And it's something that we are hardwired by natural selection to get positive feedback from doing, solving real world problems. We are the problem solving species. I've got two questions that go hand in hand here. I'll give them both and, and they operate on the same theory. Having been involved in California 4 to 12, grades 4 to 12 public school math curriculum, how can we change the incentives for mm. districts and state policymakers away from test scores? And the companion piece, mm. if universities know that collaboration and innovation is most important, why do they still emphasize the test scores and the AP classes? So take us through the grades there. Well, universities are increasingly dropping the requirements on various kinds of grades. I don't think Stanford looks at SATs anymore, for example. I think that, you know, th th there's a move away from that. But the, the, I despair of being able to change the emphasis on standardized testing in this country. I mean, it just seems to be endemic. Uh, and it gets worse and worse. We seem to be locked into this model that education is instructional, that it's about passing tests and that it's about doing certain things. We're obsessed by metrics, we're obsessed by standardization, we're obsessed by learning procedures. All of which are these outsourceable things. I mean, the procedural learning is outsourceable anyway. We should be taking note of that guy who runs the outsourcing company with 260,000 really good people and saying we should be developing innovative thinkers because that's the world we live in. Not only because of the careers, but because of our technologies and our society, people are gonna have much more leisure. The more you know, the more you can think creatively, the more you can enjoy your leisure and be productive in your leisure. I suspect most of us now have more than one job. I've got five or six jobs, all quite different, because that's the way the world has changed. And I think even more people will have the same thing. They'll do different things, and they'll bring their skills to them. So, but the question was, how can we change it? I have no idea how we change it. I mean, it's, it took Finland a lot of effort, and it's a very different kind of society. The, only hope would be on a state-by-state -state level. You know, we look at, we compare the United States with Finland, we say, we're a big company, country, Finland's a small country, but compare it state-by-state, -state, then there's some rooms. I mean, Massachusetts has actually done, interestingly enough, Romney was quite good before he started running for president. Um, he did interesting things in, 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 in Massachusetts, and some of the states have actually made inroads into education. There's a couple of states, I think it may even be North Carolina, which is interesting given recent political events there. But I think they were the ones that actually started to instigate a Finnish type educational system and work towards it. Um, Louisiana is also moving in those directions. So on a state level, you could probably do it, but it's gonna be a huge problem because you know, we're, we're a complex society. Uh, Finland is a much less complex society. It's a much more unified society. Is, is teaching and are, are teaching and education as politicized there as they are here? No. Do they, do they share more universal goals? I'm, I'm trying to get Yeah, it's a, it is a different society. We, ne we, we need to be very, effect, very aware of the fact. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very Western capitalistic society, but it also comes out of a socialist tradition. It was almost a, a Soviet satellite for many decades. So uh, there's a strong social sense, as there is in all of Northern Europe. So it is a very different society. Um, and, and people, and there's a much narrower bay, band of, of salaries. I mean, teachers are not the highest paid, but the difference between the highest paid and the lowest paid is not, not that huge. So it is a very different society, and it, it's, um, you know, there are many things different. Um, it's only by looking at the states in the US that you could start to make comparisons, and there are still distinctions. So the, you know, the, whoever asked the question, I don't have a magic bullet for changing it. Um, I mean, I go around giving talks and I write blogs and things, 
trying to get the right ideas out, but um, I don't, I'm not optimistic, actually, about being able to make those changes. What's your perspective on math homework? Is it necessary and does it fit into the collaboration communication model? Well, Finland has almost none. They have a much shorter work day, a school day as well. Math, it, it, in terms of mathematics, um, it's not based on the amount of time you spend. It, it, it's, it's the quality of the thinking that, that it's all about. Um, Although, if you were talking about applying it in real life situations, it's almost as though the homework versus, you know, in class becomes irrelevant because it, your life is happening all the time. One of the reasons why people want to start integrating mobile phones into the classroom is, is, is because the kids carry the mobile phone everywhere. If the mobile phone becomes part of the education, then that travels wherever the phone does. One of the advantages of video games is that's what people spend more... I mean, by the time kids graduate from school in this country, they'll have spent more time playing video games than in all of their classrooms put together. More hours spent in, in, in playing games than in classrooms. It, it, you've got to be, interpret the word games in a fairly general sense, but sort of digital activities, social network stuff, that amount of time already exceeds quite considerably the time spent in, in classrooms. So the more we blur the distinction between learning and the rest of the life, which gets very easy with modern technology, the more learning becomes 24-7 stuff. It's something that should just be part of life, and it's easy to do it. It's actually not that... In principle, it's easy to do it. Actually, engineering it the first time round is tricky. But it's, it's doable. And that segues into someone's questions about iPads. Are there any good iPad or any platform apps that teach higher levels of math, for example, calculus? If not, is it possible to teach those upper levels of math with an app? Yes, but it's interesting, the, the, the use of apps, um, in terms of education, there's a bunch of apps have come out for uh, elementary education. Most of them are actually not very good, but there are some good ones came out. Um, there are some apps that are appearing for sort of middle school, but once you get to high school onwards, the role for video games in particular, uh, and, and sort of apps on iPads, the role really becomes different, because what's characteristic of sort of mathematics from calculus onwards, and, 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 and actually to a large extent from algebra onwards, formal algebra, uh, is it really is paper and pencil stuff. It really is something that you do literally sit down. You know, you might be in a collaborative team, but when it time comes to solve that calculus problem, you basically sit there and you have to think linearly and, and reflectively for some time on a paper and pencil with no time constraints. So those are features that are, really, are not suited to a, to a video game that's engaging. But the way to use video games for higher mathematics is to use them to set up the problem. As part of solving a video game set problem, you solve a calculus problem, and then you go back in. Let me give one example. You could play a, a game like World of Warcraft or whatever. Um, in World of Warcraft, for those of us that spent many hundreds of hours playing World of Warcraft, uh, when you've reached a certain level of, of, of performance, you can acquire a mount, a horse or something that will travel, that allow you to travel around the world more quickly. And so you, you acquire a, motor, a transportation device. I could imagine a game like that where when you reach that level, you have the ability to build a device. So you, you, you're in the world and, you, and you've got this equipment that you've collected and you play the game and you've collected all of these, these raw materials, then you have to assemble them into a, a mount that works or a car, a plane or something. How do you do that? You get together with your friends, off out of the game, you design the thing using tools, and then you go back on and you go onto the website, you put it together and you upload it. So you've built a vehicle, you've designed it using mathematics that you've had to learn in the process with the teacher's help. Instead of, the teach, instead of having to give that work in on a piece of paper and let the teacher grade it, that game is gonna grade your work. Will your airplane fly? Will your ship sail across that ocean? Will whatever you've built work the way you want it to do? So you do the mathematics out of the game, and then you apply it in the game. So the way to use the video games is to simulate a problem that's interesting to do, that requires mathematics, and then you go back and do it. That's how the mathematicians at NASA work. The mathematicians at NASA aren't sitting in the space shuttle, actually nobody's sitting in the space shuttle anymore, but they were sitting at NASA doing work. But what was going on? We wanted to put spacecraft up there. That revolved a lot of mathematics. 
the mathematics was done in a traditional setting, but the test of that mathematics wasn't an exam, it was will that space shuttle take off? Everybody that was involved was excited because the final exam was great. You watched the shuttle take off. You were part of that. That was the reward, it was exciting. Tons of mathematics. Very few people have the opportunity to work for NASA. But you can do that in a video game. You can have a spacecraft video game. You can be a NASA engineer in a simulation and millions of kids around the world can do it. We can create video game simulations of all the coolest occupations, including fighting for the, I mean, the modern, I did a project for the US Army last year. The US Army is incredibly highly user of, of technologies and mathematics. You know, the modern soldier is a walking information center with, with sensors and everything on and, and rapid thinking required. You can use, for kids who like fighting battle games, you can create battle games that involve using mathematics. You can give everybody the coolest job they want that requires mathematics. Real mathematics. You're not doing the mathematics in the game per se. Mm -hmm. But when you step back, you are. You have done it, yes. That NASA, that NASA engineer that was sitting in a cafe in Palo Alto trying to solve that problem, he or she was part of the space shuttle. They went in the space shuttle, but they were part of the whole thing. Well, that takes us back to, to the issue of assessment. We were talking earlier yeah. about how trying to convince American states and, and American politicians that, that the test needn't be the god of all, that that's not the best way to assess. If you're on the job and you're putting a space shuttle up, there's your assessment. I got a couple questions, though, on assessment in the educational format. It's what is being done to identify what content really needs to be learned? How do you assess what needs to be learned? What someone needs to be able to do to access or find somewhere, somewhere on an as-needed basis? And uh, along with that, what's being done in the area of assessment to move away from isolation and memorization and allow for collaboration, multiple possible answers for a given problem? Yeah. So again, we keep coming back, assessment, yeah, assessment. We worry way too much about content. It really doesn't matter what the content is. It really doesn't matter what the content is. You know, let's think in terms of physical activity. You know, the, the US has this problem with obesity and lack of exercise. It doesn't mean to say everyone needs to lift weights for two hours, uh, run half a marathon, ride a bike for two hours, swim. You know, I, I used to like running, I like cycling, I hate swimming. I've picked my activities and I pursue mine and because I pursue them enough, I keep moderately fit and healthy. Different people do different things. So in the case of physical activity, we recognize that you don't need everybody to worry about content. The fact that you're physically active is what keeps you fit and healthy and give you, gives you a good life. It's not a content issue, it's an activity issue. It's the same in mathematics education. It's not what you learn, it's that you're learning something and you're doing something that matters. You're exercising that mental organ. It really makes no difference what the content is. You know, I think one of the problems with, and actually if you read the Common Core Standards, people obsess about what's in there. If you actually read them, there's actually issues about thinking skills that are involved. The National Research Council back in 2000 produced a book called Adding It Up, which was an account of the goals of, of K-12 education and one of the things did, I actually talk about this a lot in my own book about the, the video game, the mathematics education for a new era. They talk about five intertwined threads of education and it's all about learning to think a certain way. There are certain disciplines within mathematics that are typically used to develop those abilities, but you could throw them out and introduce some new ones. And actually in some cases, I think we should throw some, I mean, we should throw calculus out of the high schools and replace it by probability and statistics. Not because those are better for learning how to think, simply because they're more relevant to people. Kids, you can give kids problems involving probability and statistics that are relevant to their lives here and now and will be self-evidently relevant to their lives. It's hard to motivate most kids with a calculus problem because unless they're going to be an engineer or a physicist or some kind of a scientist, they're not going to see the benefit of that and there actually won't be one. So, you know, we have a choice. We could teach... We could develop certain skills using probability and statistics and discrete mathematics, or we can develop that sort of general thinking skills using calculus. We've got hung up on the calculus because it was really important in the 19th century. But we've, we've been in the 21st century now. Why do we obsess over something that was critical in the 19th century 
when we could be developing mental abilities by getting kids to do something that's actually relevant here and now in the 21st century. So throw out the calculus and put in probability and statistics. It doesn't matter in terms of learning how to think, but You'll boy would it make a difference think. in terms of motivation. Our last question, and it's, it's very results oriented, so you know, the takeaway on this. As a faculty member at a university, I've been trying to help the administration see the importance of collaboration and communication skills for all students, yet I'm encountering resistance and uh, traditional approaches that don't work. How can I help the administration change their mind, their mindset, to see the value of communication? Yeah, um, I share your pain. <laughs> Because I, 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 mean, I, yeah, I do the same thing all the time. I mean, I, I, it, it's, it's extremely, people, the education system is like, a, it's an oil tanker at sea. And it, the most you can do is start to nudge you. I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's anyone who's in it, it, it you, you either laugh at it the way I'm laughing at it and the way that guy in the front of friend of mine who's laughing at it, <laughs> you either laugh at it or you cry because it's really hard to change it. Um, Any wisdom you can pass along? Well, if, you know, the world has changed many times, and change always begins with three or four people deciding they'll try to change something. It's going to have to change ground, grass, grassroots upwards. You know, some interesting things are happening in the educational field. Um, I follow a lot of blogs. By, I'm not a K through 12 teacher. I mean, I, I get terrified at the idea of being put in front of any kids under the age of 19 or so. so I, uh, I mean, freshmen scare me, let alone characters. So I, I don't have the skill set for doing that. Um, but I follow a lot of blogs by, by good teachers uh, that have the blogs. Um, interesting phenomenon. You go around the country, and I, I mean, I, I do go around the country and I talk to them. Pretty well every school you'll find one or two teachers who are really struggling to do something different. And they're outnumbered in that school because it's tradition and there's a whole bunch of reasons that then they're outnumbered. So what do they do? They go home at night and they vent their ideas and their, their frustrations online in their blogs. And so, at home in the evening, they're part of this big community. They have a big common room. They don't have a common room at school that they're interested in. In fact, they, they won't want to go to the common room because they'll be outnumbered. But when they go home, they're part of a big common room. And it's connected by social media. They exchange ideas, they, they talk about curriculum, and they get reinforcement from each other that they're actually doing the right thing. You know, it's very difficult making a change if you think you're the only person. But when you realize that you're one of many thousands spread across the country, that's empowering. Social media has toppled governments. You know, I mean, Egypt is having an election now, in large part, not solely, but in large part, catalyzed by the fact that people were empowered because of social media, and they realized they weren't small groups of people. You've got these teachers communicating and forming their own virtual common room and giving each other encouragement, exchanging ideas, new ways of learning how to do things, new ways of teaching, that's going to grow. And as they go up and a generation retires, it probably will change, but it's not going to be a revolution. It's going to be a, an e evolution. Got it. But I, I get encouraged when I go on those blogs because I see that all across the country there are teachers with really good ideas who are trying new things. They are frustrated by what I think is called the Monday problem. It's that whatever you do, next Monday the kids are gonna to have to take a test. And you owe it to those kids to put them through the test. And they don't want their kids to fail, so either they'll do something innovative, and then they'll say, okay, now the boring bit, because we have to get you ready for this test next week. Right. Uh, it would be nice to get beyond that, but I think that's gonna be a while before it comes. Well, if anybody needs the persuasive material, this is going to be on the Tech Museum's website as a podcast, so you can pass it on to your administrators and see if that helps at all. Mm. And um, I will, our conversation with Keith is ongoing here at the Tech, so I'm going to pass all these questions we didn't get to on to you, mm -hmm. and maybe you can incorporate them for our next time we chat. So thank you very much. Happy to do so. Okay. Nice talking to you again.